to bring in some questions from the Q and A, some of which you've answered as you've got along. But there's a, there's always a good bunch in there. But first, just give us a, a, a very very quick tour in synopsis form of of what of what ancient DNA, the ancient DNA process is, or ancient ge ge genomics. Like how does that work? Have you given us some examples of how your processes work? But just spell that out for us. Yeah. So, um, well, it revolves around a series of um, steps. Um, the first is to um, take a small sample of bone, the powder. So you drill it with a very sterile um, drill. And um, this is a, you have to be very careful here because, you know, you have to try and eliminate uh, as much modern human DNA contamination as you possibly can. So it's usually best done in sterile conditions. And one of the best, uh, um, the, the breakthroughs here was to ensure uh, very clean rooms that were used for doing this kind of work. Um, later, that uh, DNA is then, um, is, then, is, is then extracted using a series of chemical steps, um, using a, a process of amplification, which amplifies the amount of DNA that you've got using a process called PCR, um, polymerase chain reaction. And it's a way that you can amplify the number of the amounts of DNA that you've got in a very quick way. Nowadays, there are these very powerful um, uh, means of, of sequencing the DNA very rapidly. It, it takes now several days to uh, sequence all of the DNA that you extract and to turn that um, the DNA the DNA that you've um, I, um, taken from the bone into a, the series of letters that you need to then sequence it. Um, so the 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 science is now termed next generation sequencing um, because it is um, a combination of the ability to sequence vast numbers of DNA very quickly, but also new developments in chemistry which allow you to eliminate the contamination and to focus simply on the very ancient DNA. And this is the DNA that's become degraded over time. So there are chemical tricks now that you can pull out all of the DNA that's likely to be very ancient and to purify that and to only sequence those parts of the DNA to get the sequences that are then robust and are, are arguably are ancient rather than ancient plus modern, which is the problem that plagued DNA um, research for, for many years prior to about 2004. And just give us a, a very brief flavour as well, if you would, of the radiocarbon process. Yes, so, um, well, with radiocarbon dating, what we're doing is we're measuring um, the remaining uh, radioactive isotope of carbon. So everything in the world today contains carbon. We build our bodies from it. But a tiny proportion of that carbon is radioactive. And that means that when an animal or a living organism dies, the amount of radiocarbon slowly starts to degrade and disappear away um, exponentially. And we know how long that process takes. So it takes just over five and a half thousand years for half of the radiocarbon in a given body of carbon to disappear back to its parent isotope. So this means we can date anything from today back into about 55,000 years ago. Beyond that, we have to use other techniques, other methods, um, of which there are a few. Um, but radiocarbon is the best method for dating the recent period, particularly when, um, by recent I mean 50, 50, 000, the last 50,000 years ago. Um, because this is um, the period when the last Neanderthals are present, when the last Denisovans are present, and so on. So that's the method that we use a great deal to date um, these um, uh, late um, uh, archaeological sites that are so important to, in the field of human evolution. So Lydia says, awesome, thank you. Have we compared Denisovan DNA presence, or the presence of DNA, D Denisovan DNA, to personality tests. So can, can, can this DNA re reveal anything about personality she wants to know? What, what has it shown or what might you expect it to show? No, that hasn't, um, that hasn't been done. And um, there are, there are um, there, the, the jury is really still out on whether this is, um, uh, this is uh, in fact uh, possible. So most of the work that's been done so far is, um, has simply been to um, sequence the DNA to get to, to, to extract it and to identify it to compare it to modern populations. But the actual question of the function of that DNA and what it actually imparts to the people living today that inherit some of that DNA, this is still that's this is still work that's going on. It's work in progress. And um, what's really been inter interesting in the last few years is been the efforts that have been um, going on to look at modern biobanks, modern uh, databases of human DNA and to look at what parts of archaic DNA um, can be found in those uh, in, in those modern human databases and then to look at traits um, that um, appear in the human biobank data um, and to compare those with 
the presence of certain uh, archaic traits that we find from the archaic DNA. And, um, but personality traits, no, I don't know too much about that, I'm afraid. Um, we're, um, we're mostly looking at things that are physical um, traits at the moment. Um, uh, although there are a few hints that we have so far um, regarding certain types of behaviours that um, are prevalent in, in, in human populations. One of those is, um, for example, chronotypes. Um, whether you're a morning person, an evening person, um, this is uh, very interestingly quite, quite strongly linked to the presence of Neanderthal DNA in, the, in, a, in parts of our modern human genome. So there's a whole um, amount of research going on to look at the function of this DNA and what it actually, uh, what it actually gives us the ability to do. It, it must be so exciting to use the word you've already used, to be in a field where developments seem to be coming so thick and fast. Well, this is the this is the dangerous thing about writing a book like this because, you know, it can be out of date quite quickly. In fact, this uh, past week there have been two really big papers that have come out. One of one of one of which was about the size of the human skull and the brain, and the other one which was about uh, Denisovans in um, Island Southeast Asia. Fortunately, for the the latter one, I was um, able to um, get some of the information prior to the publication coming out, so I was able to write about that in the book. In the chapter on um, on Homo erectus, so luckily I wasn't um, I wasn't immediately um, turned into um, last week's news. But yeah, it's a very fast moving field. Every week something happens. Um, it's really hard to keep up, actually. Could you just reiterate where the other hominid species come from? Mar Marek, who says it's fascinating, talk wants to know where the other hominid how the other hominid species come from. So if Homo sapiens comes from Africa, just to reiterate. Yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Okay. Sure. So um, ultimately, um, species such as Homo erectus, um, Homo habilis, all of, the part, all of the early members of the genus Homo, um, as far as we can detect, they all come out of Africa. Ultimately, all of these hominins um, come out of Africa. Africa is the engine room of evolution of this genus. That's where we find most of the variation, and that's where we find the earliest evidence for these various groups, including ourselves. But why do we, what, why is that the case? Well, why, why, why was, Africa, the cradle, or is Africa the cradle of humanity? Well, it's, I think it's because we find there, um, the, our earliest uh, ancestors, we find a, a great variety of the, um, of, of, the, of the human and the um, Australopithecine conditions, condition. So we find um, many different types of uh, human ancestor there um, in, the, in the equatorial and the um, subtropical regions. This is where um, this is where our, our ultimate ancestry is. So it, again and again, it proves to be the case. This is the engine room, and it's only there that uh, our ancestry um, is first visible, and then only subsequently later comes out into Eurasia and the rest of the old world. Tom, you've already you've already said that you don't think it was inevitable that human beings, that Homo sapiens, would, would become the dominant force. Daniela just wants you to speculate, if you would, on or why you think we are the only species of hominid that survived. Yeah, so again, um, th there's a very interesting, there was a very interesting paper that came out um, about this actually, that um, may have some um, interesting implication for this. Um, uh, I, although I haven't um, digested it properly because it only came out three days ago, um, what these researchers discovered was that there was a genetic switch that uh, appears to have taken place at some point in the last uh, 40 to 60,000 years, perhaps, which seems to have um, resulted in um, brains that um, grow much quicker um, and become bigger, faster in young infants. And this may be um, um, significant when we're looking at perhaps one of the reasons why it was our lineage that ended up being the successful one. People have speculated before that it may have been some, um, there may have been some genetic advantage that came about, but it's, it, it never really been subsequently um, um, shown um, with any degree of confidence. So that's a possibility. There may be some um, intrinsic reason, but, um, but certainly um, I think that, as I said before, that personally, I think that there's a d degree of luck in this um, and that any, um, any innate advantage that we had wasn't, significant, um, wasn't significantly apparent when we're looking back at the archeological record. Um, by virtue of the fact we had a very long period of overlap, I think this means that at the time we didn't have a great advantage. Subsequently, we may, may have done. Um, and it's interesting to speculate on the reasons why that process occurred and whether or not we benefited from the contact that we had with these 
now disappeared cousins during the course of that process. But one thing is for sure, at some point we became a very successful um, and, and largely invasive species that was able to populate all parts of the globe and every single environment um, becomes ultimately uh, the human niche. Um, and that success is of course now patently obvious to everybody because we are everywhere and uh, we're the most successful um, lineage that there is, the only one left. It strikes me as an important question given your discovery of these hybrid humans. Without the hybrid, would we definitely have been as successful as we have become? I mean, how important is this hybrid business? Yeah. So I think hybridization is one of the most important um, parts of this evolutionary story. And I think you're right, without it, we, we, we may not be here. And it's, a, it's, a, it's part of the current human condition. But and let's just see pause this. for a second then. Let's yeah. just pause for a second. Yeah. What you're saying is that your discovery of this, of, of this hybridization may actually be the key to understanding how we as human beings are actually here today. So I'm yeah. talking on Zoom with the bloke from New Zealand <laughs> who, has work, who has worked, who has worked, who basically worked out the sort of the missing link. The missing link is no. this organization. Yeah, this is not, this is not um, my work. I, there are other people that have done yeah, well, come uh, on, hard this work is, on this, but, what, but it's what, becoming what apparent to, it, yeah, what it's becoming apparent. Happen? I've just put my finger on the importance of this research, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, you're right. We're seeing this again and again. Hybridization, interbreeding is one of the keys to successful, fast adaptation to new environments. And we see this with animals as well as humans. So remember I mentioned, for example, the, um, the, the gene, uh, the EPAS1, the variant that gives us, or gives Tibetans the ability to live at high altitude that comes from Denisovans. You know, without that, little section of DNA. It's very, very difficult for people like us to live at altitude and have children and survive and prosper there. And it comes from Denisovans. So yes, that without that adaptation, without that hybridization, those people would not have that benefit. So there's a classic example of that, you know, without hybridization, we would have struggled. We would have struggled. And it's the same with animals. We see it in animals as well. The Tibetan Mastiff, the Yak, the same things happen. They interbred with other animals living at altitude. They hybridized with them and rapidly were able to adapt to that environment. We see this uh, in baboons, baboons in Africa. There are six or seven different um, uh, species of baboon that interbreed with one another and they hybridize. They're to all intents and purposes, they look different, but they hybridize with one another. And this gives them certain changes to their, to their genome. So it's, it's a way of fast adapting to, to new environments. And in the case of Denisovans, who I think were probably living east of Wallace's line in places like Papua New Guinea, the people that lived there had a long time to adapt to the local conditions, to develop resistance to diseases and parasites and microbes. And when modern humans arrived, they interbred with them, they generated the benefit to do the same thing. So it was the ability to, to, to sort of borrow those advantageous genes that gave humans the ability to live in these difficult environments, rather than having to wait for evolution to work its magic and to develop those adaptations slowly through mutations and so on, they were able to sort of literally take those advantages. And we got from Neanderthals a lot of things as well uh, and, and from Denisovans too. So the really interesting detective work, I think in no small um, way is looking at these little things that we got and what they, what they actually do functionally. Incredible stuff. This is an important question from an anonymous attendee who says, or asked, are these traces, are these traces of DNA, for example, the Neanderthal traces, are they relevant to medicine? It's Tim actually asking the question. Yes, yes, that's right. And um, some of you um, also may know that um, in the last uh, few months, uh, again, by uh, comparing Neanderthal genome data with modern human data from these large biobanks, and particularly new medical data, which shows, for example, how people react um, to uh, COVID-19, it's been possible to show that in two cases that Neanderthal DNA that is um, inherited by people has the ability to confer a little bit more protection to people who have COVID, but on the flip side to also make it worse for them. So this is the thing about these inherited sections of DNA. Sometimes they give us an advantage and some, sometimes they don't. They can be actually deleterious. And that's the, that's the trick, that's the difficulty. There's no kind of easy answer to some of these questions, but yes, um, 
it's, it's very clear now that um, one of the great benefits of this work, uh, of this particularly this genome work, is that people have slight differences now in, in, in terms of their DNA, and that this gives them um, a different way of reacting to certain diseases and certain problems with immunology, um, immunological responses, and so on. And so when we're looking at, at tailoring medical um, science to individual people, and more and more we're getting into the genome area, we're going to find that their inheritance, their ancient inheritance, is often going to be as important to the way that they are able to resist and react to diseases and illnesses um, than just the blanket uh, um, uh, modern human DNA that we've become used to over the last few decades. As a redhead, am I more likely than you are to be a bit, bit more Neanderthal? So um, people thought that Neanderthal, um, Neanderthals had red hair um, for quite some time because of some um, DNA work that was undertaken on some um, Neanderthals from uh, a site called El Cidron in, uh, in Spain. But we now know that there was probably a variation amongst Neanderthals and they weren't by any means all redheads, although some of them may, be, may have been. It's the same with skin tone with Neanderthals. We think that there was probably a variety of different skin tones, rather like we have today. We shouldn't look at people um, then in, in, to be greatly different than um, we, were, we are today. So, so no, I'm afraid that it doesn't look as though Neanderthal equals red hair. Let's finish with this question from LG. It's a really perceptive question. The previous assumptions that our earlier cousins couldn't have been like us, is there an arrogance or insecurity behind that? An assumption that we simply must be unique. Can we learn humility from the emerging science? There must be a lot of interesting philosophical thought that could come out of the new evidence, says LG. I think that's a fantastic point. And, you know, this is, uh, this is something that we're seeing um, evidence for again and again. You know, we, we, we're, the only, we're the only ones here and therefore we must be the best. And I think that when we look back in evolutionary time, what we see is a, is a picture of extinction and, you know, survival and bottlenecks, populations going down, populations going up. And I think, like I said before, that there were probably elements of great luck that our ancestors enjoyed periodically and benefits that we obtained from meeting our sadly lost ancestors, but also the beautiful thought that we, that these people aren't entirely lost, that we have vestiges of them in our own genomes today. We carry them with us. You know, we are the sum of a great ancestry of, of parts from different groups, different lineages that live with us today. And if we pull out all parts from, uh, from us of um, the Neanderthal genomes, we can get about 20% of the Neanderthal genome from every person living in the world today, which is a very um, uh, high amount. So, yeah, I think it, it is a very sobering thought and, and one that leads us to think, not an arrogant, in an arrogant way that, you know, we're the most successful ones because we're the only ones that survived, but to think we should be grateful for what we have and for the ancestry that we carry with us today. Let's hope we carry it with us for a long time to come. It's absolutely riveting, riveting to, to listen to you and to see your enthusiasm. And it's such a skill to be able to be at the cutting edge of this sort of research, but also to be able to, to tell the story as effectively as you do. So we're really grateful for you spending the last hour with us at How To Academy, Tom. And your Thank book you. is available on the How To Academy website, The World Before Us. I think we can all learn a huge amount from it. You can find Tom on Twitter. You, I've already started following him. You can find me on Twitter as well at Matthew Stadler. Thank you for giving up part of your Friday evening to us, but I hope you'll agree it wasn't time wasted because I've certainly learned the most enormous amount. Tom, thank you so much. It's really fun. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for, for coming along. I, I really appreciate it. And I, I hope that um, you enjoy reading the book and um, get in touch with it if you have any other questions. And good luck in the World Test Championship final at Lords. Thanks, Matthew.